my time, think it's my air, yeah, yeah. Good morning, everybody. Happy Thursday. Can't believe it's Thursday already. The week is flying by. Regardless, welcome to the morning show here on Stock Market TV. Got a new guest on the show today, Mr. Larry Tentarelli. He'll be on, I guess, in about a half hour or so. Uh, and he sent, sent over a few charts. So very excited to talk to Larry. He, of course, uh, runs the uh, Blue Chip Daily Trend Report. Uh, let's see what else we have. We have some highlights from JC's conference call. Last night, we're not going to give away at all, but a couple of charts, one, two, maybe three, or talk about our favorites from the call. If you missed the call last night and you're a member of All Star Charts Premium, go ahead and, and watch it on the replay. If you're not a member of All Star Charts Premium, we'll tell you how to become a member later on. Um, what else do we have today? Uh, it's Thursday. We'll have Mr. Sean McLaughlin on the show as he joins us every single Thursday. And uh, that's the plan. So let's get the show on the road here and... Uh, and the guy's on. All right, Mr. Straza, how excited are you that the Knicks are the two seed this year? Can we talk? We, we had, nobody even mentioned it. No? How long has it been? Since the Knicks were the How long season? has it been since we? I, I don't remember. 20, 20 years, probably. My Knicks, my friends that are Knicks fans who I haven't heard talk about basketball in decades are now coming out of the woodwork, like running right their mouth. Uh, my friends do that I with see the how it is. also. I see how it is. Every, yeah. I mean, it. Hasn't been this good for the Knicks and Rangers since like 1984, right? Julius <laughs> Randle needs to go. He's a bum. <laughs> That's right, Spencer. So. Um, yeah, but what's his name yeah, is Brunson. awesome. Uh, the guy with yeah, Brunson is a stud. Yeah, he's, their, he's their star player. But yeah. Randall, terrible defender, slow on the court, lazy as hell. Big... Get him out of there. He's a bum. He's a bum. He's not in there. He's not the even Italian in there. Get him out of there forever. They're better without him. Uh, Aren't they, they got spending the Italian a fortune on that bum? Now? He's not even in. Money, I think it's deep in chance, He doesn't play anymore. I got no beef with the Knicks. All right. You see, how was right, the call last night? Why don't you hit that bumper there, Mr. Spencer? How was the call last night? Good? Talks that have been going down this year. All right. All right, let's do a quick little morning rundown. Dow Futures up 50 points this morning. Uh, so that's uh, pretty much flat. Uh, you got the S&P Futures up four handles. So pretty much flat. Not much going on at all. NASDAQ 100 Futures uh, up 10 basis points. Nothing really happening in the equities market so far this Quiet. morning. Bond Futures down again. Seems to be an ongoing trend here with these Treasury bonds. Gold Futures uh, up Eight points, so just under 2,400 for gold. You got silver up 50 basis points, 28 and a half for silver. Uh, crude oil down 50 basis points, just under $82 a barrel. Uh, you got the dollar slightly higher in early trading, but not much movement there. Volatility index hanging in there above 18. And then over in the old uh, funny money, you got Bitcoin, BTC, up 1% this morning, right under 62,000. You got Ethereum. 3,000 even, up 50 basis points this morning. And Solana, uh, pretty much flat on the day, 132. Total crypto market cap, Spencer Israel, below 2.2 trillion. How about that? Yeah. Yeah, I don't... I... Keeps going lower. I know what to say about that. Yeah, I guess it's lower. I guess that's what there is well, to the say. the value of all the cryptocurrencies are falling, uh, the, uh, the total value of all the cryptocurrencies probably isn't going up. Uh, yeah, yeah. I don't know. A a a every week it seems like I'm lowering the bar. So let's see. Uh, before I was saying, call me when it gets to like 2.6, and then call me when it gets to 2.5, call me when it gets to 2.4, and now call me when it gets to 2.3, right? So, yeah, Bitcoin when it dominance uh, on the chat. They're talking about the Bitcoin dominance. Bitcoin has its largest weighting in the cryptocurrency markets in two years. 
uh, excuse me, three years. Wow. These are three wow. year highs in Bitcoin dominance. Yep. I did not realize that. Yeah, Bitcoin uh, total dominance now. Uh, I want to talk about uh, slide two here. So what are we looking at? So far in 2024, what are we seeing? We're seeing the majority of stocks in the New York Stock Exchange are down this year. Two-thirds of the stocks on the NASDAQ are down this year. The majority of stocks in the NASDAQ 100 are down this year. The majority of stocks in the Russell 2000 right. are down this year. And the majority of stocks in the S&P mid-cap 400 are down this year. And this isn't something like we woke up this morning and we've been seeing it. This has been kind of like an ongoing, you know, uh, progression over the last couple of months where fewer and fewer stocks are going up. Now more and more stocks are actually going down. So that's something new. Uh, but this deterioration has been in place for a couple of months now, which, you know, in the meeting yesterday, we were talking about how, you know, before... The easier trade, like last year, for example, the easier trade was to bet on rotation, was to bet on breakouts, you know, bases being completed, because there were so many stocks that were doing that. What we're seeing this year is that window of opportunity of those types of moves and those types of stocks doing those things has been closing and closing, particularly over the last 10 weeks, um, making it making the probabilities so, of success yeah. incorporating those strategies much lower than something like last year. Okay. The majority of the trends currently so, are messy trends. We talked about it yesterday. The percentage of stocks above their 200-day but below their 50-day is through the roof, right? You see Grant's updated chart, Straza? Well, it depends on where you look, right? So uh, you, tip, you tend to not like the arbitrary year-to-date performance but I, I think this I tend is a not good to, illustration of this year in particular. You got a lot of rotation. A lot of things peaked on December the twenty seventh. So, I mean, yeah. mm. it, the, it started. In late, it started it, in late October, started in late October. That whole theme, the rotation, the rotationary theme. No, 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 no. I'm not talking about. Off I'm talking about upside post. exhaustion took place in late December. So it just, it just so happens that this year, those year-to-date numbers are actually not that skewed because there's actually a valid pivot that took yeah. place around there. So I'm saying, I agree. I usually dismiss year-to-date returns because they're usually silly. Uh, but this year is a little bit different. Then use the, then use the, okay, then use the December yeah, December 27th. Important pivot but it's about the same. Listen, I don't, I don't have a problem with year-to-date numbers. What the story is here, though, that really should be told is large over small. You said most stocks look like a mess. That's true. But if you look at a universe of large cap stocks, that's not true anymore, right? The S&P 500 as a universe, most of them don't look like a mess. Most of them look pretty good. Most of them have hit new all-time highs this cycle. If you go down to the Russell 2000, completely different story, right? Some are breaking down, breaking their range lows right now. Right. Uh, so things only, are back in the box. Just like to your before. point, only half the stocks on the S&P 500 are down this year while over two-thirds of the Russell 2000 is down this year. And that's a big difference. So 53% positive for the S&P 500, that's not bad. That, that's okay, right? Uh, and then when you look at the sectors themselves, like it's an energy story this year. Energy is up like 9%, tech 6.5%, healthcare. You need stuff like industrials, financials, cyclicals. Consumers kind of flat. Consumers just turn negative on the year. You need those bigger groups. Uh, to be performing better to get that number, you know, higher than fifty three percent. So I think when you when you think of the groups that have been leading, it kind of makes sense also. But small caps remain just a danger zone. What a mess! Danger zone. Throw up the uh, throw up the uh, the uh, Grant's updated uh, sort of uh, scenario chart here. I really really like how we did this. Very very nice. Shout out Grant. You see there what you he go. did there? So the 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 leading category yeah. there is is front and center. So you could really see that spike in the percentage of stocks that are above their 200-day but below their 50-day. Yeah, you have to put one above the other is the problem. You did That's that really nice, right? right? Yeah. It's a great chart. Mm -hmm. So what does it mean? Mm -hmm. so what does this all mean, Basil? Well, what this all means is that 
clearly this is not the same type of environment we were in last year. The strategies that were working so well last year are obviously not working that well this year. And it's, think about it. Just like from a philosophy standpoint, you still have all these monster uptrends, structural uptrends, which is why you have such a high percentage of stocks above their 200-day moving average. Great, not a secret. It's really the spikes in the stocks below their 50-day. So kind of like in the short to intermediate term range at best, downtrend at worst, um, but range at best. And and the types of strategies that do that that do well in those sorts of scenarios are, I think, the ones that we need to be incorporating, not the ones that were working last year in a different environment. That's all. Could this be like August of last year? What would this be like August of last year? Yeah. Correction. Already got a bit of a dip, but there was more to come. Internals, maybe no extreme readings, but still not now. Uh, maybe. It feels a little like yeah. August. August, September. You guys were getting back from Asia. It's not, it's not that different from that. It's not that different. How long do you think uh, this corrective leg? Longer than most, I think. Probably, right? Like, that's how I see it. Like, how long is it going to last? Probably, I think this is a big one right here. Look at slide five. How bearish were you last night? How bearish night? was I in the conference call? Not, not that bearish. Yeah. Yeah, probably more neutral than anything else. So we had the conference call last night. So to answer your question, first of all, uh, you know, what? how long do I think it's going to last? As long as these two lines keep going up, uh, I think it's I think it's a problem for equities, right? These things keep going higher. Things keep getting worse overbought. in the stock market, right? They're both overbought right, right Which now. is characteristic of uptrends, right? Right? We see overbought conditions and uptrends fairly regularly. So that's that's mine. So last night was our, our mid-month conference call. We got together. It was about 140 charts in about an hour. Very uh, efficient. A little under the weather. A little under the weather, but I, I pulled through, right? You did get sick. Yeah, I told you you were going to get sick. You know, I got, I actually got home and all my kids were sick. So that's, that's probably, you know, it wasn't like we were in Miami out partying and everything like that. Quite the opposite. You know, we're pretty mellow. I think I got, I think I got the conference. conference did. No, I'm all right. I'll live. But uh, last night's conference call was a big one. Really, really important where we talked about some, some, some key changes in this market, some strategies that we want to incorporate. So Spencer, if you want to drop the link, anybody who wants to access that, um, obviously it's for premium members of All-Star Charts and I'm not going to be Mr. Sales guy, but you know, it's it was a really good video, I think, so. <laughs> yep, I dropped the link in the chat. All right, thank you, Spencer. So this is what I'm looking at. I think this is the big key theme. As long as these lines are going up, I think things in the stock market are going to continue to get worse. Like we've seen it. It's not like all oh, these lines are going to go up and things are going to get better. And then another good one, Straz, uh, throw up slide five, Spencer. Another good one is this one, right? I know you like it as well. Um, I think this tells a really interesting story too. So if you're, you know, if you're like me and you're being patient and you're the old man being boring and sitting on his hands and all that stuff, if you're one of those like me, this is a big one. You know, when am I going to start to get aggressive again? I'll tell you what, I'll feel a lot more comfortable being aggressive from the long side in equities if these are above those prior cycles highs, if financials are above the prior cycles highs, right? Not failing, right? You know, that's why I don't like buying stocks and putting on trades when we're hitting uh, the former highs, right? Like we've, we've discussed, right? So we can show the next two slides here. So that's why I don't like doing that. Um, here you go. Throw up slide six and seven. So I just don't feel comfortable buying financials as we're hitting those former highs. Like I used to do that when I was young and dumb in my career and, you know, I paid the consequences. That's why I got a couple of these gray hairs. This is why I don't do that because this is what normally happens, right? There are more failed breakouts than yeah, valid see, breakouts like this one, look, look at, right. look at this list waterfall list. since we hit those yeah. former highs. Yeah, the list, is, the list has gotten really long. We talked about this two weeks ago when it was happening and broker-dealer index was turning lower at those highs and the capital markets index is turning lower at those highs. Um, materials is no different. 
energy is damn close. They better be careful. And just a show announcement, if you say stupid shit in the chat and by reading your comments, you're making everyone dumber, you do get muted. Yeah, uh, bra sup. Try to cheer up, buddy. Come on, let's go. We're, we're happy around here, right? So if you want to go be depressed, there's other there's other places for you to go. And I'm sure they'll welcome you with open arms. But around here, right, we say peace, see ya. You know, so try try to be nice around here. You, you, you must be new here. Try to cheer up, buddy. Try to, try to cheer up there, little buddy. Um, all right. So I think this is, I, I, I honestly, I, I think this is a big one. This is a big key theme. You've got the S&P 500 um, on an equally weighted basis, getting back up to those former highs and failing. You've got the NASDAQ on an equally weighted basis, getting back up to those highs and failing. And you've got financials on an equally That's weighted basis, getting back yes. up to those highs and failing. Well, this is cap weighted, but oh, the sorry. point is, yeah. it's not like one chart. In a, it's not just one chart in a vacuum. You can go on down the list. I sent you a whole deck of just failed breakouts uh, yesterday. Like they're everywhere, right? So that is a, a real concern. If it was just the materials index and everything else was holding the breakouts or just financials, but everything else was holding, fine. But like you said, it's the major averages themselves on an equal weight basis. And you can go on down the list, healthcare too, right? There's just a lot of fails. If you look at the small cap indexes, um, or the mid cap indexes, you'll see even more. So, even stuff, the commodity subsectors that have been so hot, the energy subsectors that have been, you know, really good for two months now, had a fantastic February, March energy subsectors, EP, oil services failing. So, it's quite the theme right and, now. And, you know, I think that there are a lot of investors. I don't want to say I think, I, I kind of want to say I know for a fact that there are a lot of investors out there who just don't have the patience, like they just don't have the willpower and self-control to do nothing. They would rather pay super expensive, overpriced premium to put on positions in this market and, and they're just bound to get chopped up. And what that means to me is that there's opportunity to collect that income. Those investors and traders that don't have the patience, don't have the discipline, don't have the willpower, which I would argue very confidently that is the majority, those donations that are yeah. being made as investors, if we're not accepting those donations, we're, 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 we're being irresponsible, right? It's, it's, we're, not, we're not acting as fiduciaries for our own portfolios and our families, right? Like it's up to us to go and pick up those dollars on the sidewalk, right? They're making donations. I think we want to pick them up, right? Uh, Spencer, can you get in here? Can we talk about the, the NBA Moi? thing, the DraftKings thing? Moi? Yeah? Yeah, this is, this is, this is your area. Oh, I think we what have, what I missed? I think we have a DraftKings Jason, chart. is that okay? Actually, Steve, you were, you were the person that, because um, I, I was, so, so, the, so the news yesterday, yeah, was that uh, for the first time, yeah. uh, really, since legalization of sports betting, uh, one, of the, one of the major sports leagues, in, in, in America at least, um, banned, well, lifetime banned a player who was caught betting on the game, uh, betting on games that, specifically betting on games that he was not going to play in, right? That he knew he wasn't going to play He was betting that they were going to lose. He was betting on, on him, he was betting against himself, essentially. Because he he knew he could yeah. take the under on himself um, and say he was under the weather and I'm not going to play a lot today. That's what he was doing. He was taking prop bets on, on the under specifically, <laughs> which I guess is easier than easier than wow. taking the over. Right? It's a lot easier to get the under than it is to get the over. I feel right? like you should be allowed to take the over. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. Like you should be allowed yeah, to bet on right. your own team winning. Like that sure. should be okay, right? Sure. What's wrong with that? So, so, so I, That's I guess funny. he was using right. um someone else's account on DraftKings, and 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 that was the reason I I, I suppose yeah. as to why DraftKings traded so differently from the other uh, betting stocks yeah. yesterday, right? If you look at Flutter, you look at um, I mean Caesars, Caesars win and MGM are are, are not they're they're casino companies more broadly they're not pure sports betting players like flutter and DraftKings are in any case though but we discussed this we discussed this yesterday i don't think any of us have really looked into it yet you you confirmed he was definitely i using i, I, think, I did right? think i read yeah I, I do think i read that yeah um okay wow 
I mean, it's going to happen again. This is going to keep uh, happening. You should be allowed to bet no. on your own team winning. Like that, and then you should be able to announce it. Be like, I got a melee on us tonight. Let's go. You know? And the irony of the situation where NBA, all of the sports leagues, have these multi-million dollar deals with these companies that their players, you know, can't use. And if they do, they get banned for using. Uh, you know, it's a tough one. And this is new kind of uncharted territory uh, for the, the, these associations. I mean, the ultimate irony of it all yeah. is that these, you know, these leagues, everybody, frankly, is they're in on the gravy train of sports betting. It's a gigantic gravy train, right? Uh, everyone's in on it. The leagues, the teams, even the reporters, right? I mean, the, the DraftKings and FanDuel have their own Players. media operations, right? Like everyone's in on this gravy train. And then, of course, with the unspoken, not, not unspoken, actually the very, the very outspoken rule that, uh, yeah, you can't be doing this, right? You can't be betting on the game. Um, but, um, and so it was the Alex Otani thing, was that a DraftKings Shohei issue Otani? also? Um, no, no, no. The issue with that was know. he was using an, uh, a bookie. He was using like an, uh, like a illegal bookie, which actually, you know, not maybe not the only issue considering he was stealing money, but, um. Yeah, he was using like an old school bookie for that stuff, and I and I I I looked at the uh, I skimmed the uh, the DOJ's uh, report against him, and let me tell you, there are some sad text messages in that. Well, weren't wires leaving his bank account? Yeah, he was. Yeah, yeah, this, yeah, he like was. Long, the, the translator was stealing money. Yeah, and then and then he came on and said that he had no idea yeah. that this was happening. Right, so. Bullshit alert. What a lie. I, no I don't. To I, I must be the only person that actually believes the story, but I think it's totally plausible that a game. Your bank calls you. A, a wire that big, they literally call you. Imagine, imagine you don't speak any English and you have a guy that you trust that handles all your shit for you. Okay. okay. Who's going to answer the phone? You? You don't speak English. Me? I'm your I'm your guy. There's, I don't know how that works when you don't you know speak a certain his language. Own, for, for his like own agency, the, his <laughs> agency had zero people that speak Japanese, right? So it don't look good. But we're gonna see more and more of these scandals. I mean, this is just two we're talking about that uh, happened recently. Um, and DraftKings and friends are gonna sell on this kind of news because I guess also NCAA. The NCAA is really, I don't think you're going to see all these prop bets. Yeah, probably. In I, March Madness I, games and stuff. I, I, these, I would these actually throw, I would put DraftKings and, 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 and them in like, in the group. There's like a group of, of stocks that I've always thought have like an outsized, like regulatory risk. Like I, I always think like DraftKings and Uber and yeah. like Airbnb, like all these in the company, like they, I feel like one day, like a city yeah. or in DraftKings case, a, 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 a state or whatever can just come in and just like, ban you and then then what you know what i mean but you're talking about but that's that's the risk of being a disruptor right all of the companies you just named are major disruptors sure. right they completely shook up industries and, and reinvented them so that risk kind of comes with the territory and it's not necessarily a bad thing if you're doing something like uber completely reinventing the wheel right yeah regulatory regulatory was an overhang for them for a long time still still is still could what be is my point um Fascinating story, the way they grew yeah. into what they are today. Basically, by, by breaking the rules and getting away with it. They oh, yeah. should anyway. be able to bet on their own team winning. They should be able to bet on their own team winning the championship. Why not? I don't disagree. I don't I, disagree at all, but it gets sticky, I, I, right? I think the guy in the uh, NBA was betting on the Raptors losing, which people like took a great offense to. You can't do that, man. It's terrible. I, listen, they did. Should should he be banned forever from the NBA? Doesn't yes. matter because he is. Yeah, he is. Of course, he should. I, yeah, yeah, 100%, he is. Yeah. I think should be, and he is. Makes. Yeah. Some okay. people are just degenerates, man. In fact, in fact, most traders and investors are degenerates. And they have a hard time recognizing the environment that we're in. So they're incorporating the strategies that they wish they were incorporating last year. 
right? Because they were so busy being so angry about recessions and yield curves and, you know, the Powell and all this stuff and all these scary things that kept them out of the market. Now they're like, oh, now it's a bull market. Let's incorporate the strategies that I wish I was doing last year, right? That's how this works. So it's up to us who recognizes this sort of silly behavior and, and yep. take their donations. Because there's always a lag. There's always a lag, right? Yeah. 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 Yep, for sure. People, Everybody that was chasing in 2021, back half. Yeah. Yep. All right, you want to bring Larry on? Do we have airlines? Yeah, uh, Larry, oh, Larry's yeah. here, Larry Tinderelli, and he did send over uh, a number of charts that are already in the deck. Uh, where are they, Steve? Just so you're aware, they're uh, slides 10 through 17. So we got a few in there. Um, yeah, I think Larry's here. Larry's ready. So let's just um, let's bring him on. Jay, we've Make. been friends for a long time. Make the call. I mean, this is pretty professional, guys. Nice, uh, nice show you got going here. Larry, how we doing? Spencer, good morning. Good morning, and we'll, we'll have Steve uh, pop in uh, as uh, there he is. Uh, there's Jason. I, wanted, I and, wanted to say hi, Larry. How are you? Good to finally meet you. JC, good morning. A fellow Miami Hurricanes fan. Let's go. This is our year, baby. Yeah. Yeah, I, I I grew up down there. I used to go to the uh, to the lunches with the coaches every Friday before the home games. That's amazing. What you what high school did you go to? What's that? What high school did you go to? I went. I was in Fort Lauderdale, so I went to Cardinal Gibbons High School. Oh sure, yeah. Sure. And they had I went, some good baseball teams back in the day when I was around. Oh yeah, and then I went to college at Nova in uh, in Davie. I just sure. didn't finish. I spent my tuition reimbursement money, so <laughs> I never finished. That's cool. Yeah. So Mario Cristobal uh, grew up across the street from my grandparents. Actually, his father built my grandparents' house. Oh, wow. Yeah. So Very literally cool. kitty corner. And then he was a stud at Columbus High School. So like I knew of him. And then he went to the University of Miami when I was a kid, wins championships. And now we're all full circle. So small world. Very cool. Yeah. So, um, so, so talk to me, um, you know, I think it's really important uh, to, to kind of give our, our, our audience a little bit of perspective in terms of how you view the world. Um, you want to talk a little bit about your day job and what you're doing and, and from what lens you sort of view the markets? Sure. So I run a website, bluechipdaily.com. It's a subscription-based website. I've got retail investors, retail traders, portfolio managers, hedge fund managers. It's a pretty wide base. And basically, I, I just cover the markets all day, every day. I, I, you know, like you guys, I'm glued in front of the screens all day. I focus mostly on large caps, you know, the indices, the bigger stocks. And, and you know, right now, it, it's a more cautionary market environment. I've dialed back my equity exposure. I think in the middle of March, I was about 96% long stocks. Right now, I'm about 84% long stocks. So not, not a major overhaul. But the CPI breakout is a problem, you know, three months in a row above forecast. The bond yield breakout is a problem. The S&P and triple Q are below the 50 day. And when they break below the 50 day, I really put the brakes on as far as any new buys. You know, I get a little bit more defensive, uh, things like that, especially with with how fast the markets turn down after this bond yield breakout. So a longer term. I'm still bullish. I think we work higher, but I think there are some adjustments that the market has to make right now with the uh, with bond yields breaking out. So, 84% invested in stocks in a bear market. You know, how high will your cash levels get, or low will your stock exposure get? Oh, uh, geez, in in 2022, at one point, I think I was 90% cash. Oh wow! Okay, and, oh. and I, I think I went through after the after the war started in 2022. You know, it, with uh, with Russia, I went to 50 percent cash. I think February of 2022. I don't try to hold a lot of cash, but yeah. when when you know when the market was below the 200 day moving average back then, there there's just not a lot to buy. So I'm yeah. a believer that it's a market of stocks. But most stocks tend to follow the index. So, but you know, right now I would I would rather 
my equity exposure right now not go under 80% because I'm not bearish. I don't think we've got a change in the longer term trend. Economic data is strong. Jobs data is strong. You know, yep. there's a lot of charts that are working, but, you know, it, it's like a seesaw when those bond yields broke out like they did. Mm -hmm. Stock prices do have to adjust to lower. So I'm not I'm not bearish, but we're just in a in a pullback phase right now. So I'm just a little bit more cautious. Aren't we getting to like a, a far healthier place in terms of the bond market and um, Fed expectations, though? We went from a market that was expecting seven cuts and then had to find out it might get zero to a market that's now expecting zero and maybe finds out it gets a couple by the end of the year right so so that risk has shifted for me in a big way we came into this year and it was like god they're expecting seven cut that market's asking for and expecting a lot already and pricing right. that in, right that that became a headwind those expectations that's gone now we've completely reset so i think we're at a healthier place you kind of how do you think about that yeah you know the the data changes so fast so you're right i think the beginning of the year the consensus was rate cut in march six or seven yeah. rate cuts you know jerome powell's got our back but the, the issue is they still have not beat inflation yet and you know the the fed i'm surprised that their their rhetoric has stayed basically as dovish as it has you know yeah. it's yeah. election year I don't think they want to upset the apple cart, to be honest with you, you know, and, and Powell gets pressure from both ends. So there's a group of people that say rates are too high. People can't buy a house. The average guy is struggling. You need to cut rates. And then there's another group of politicians that say, listen, inflation's too high. The average guy is still struggling. You need to beat inflation. So they, you know, they really can't win. Uh, yeah, I think when they said that, you know, when they put rate cuts on the table, uh, you know, that was a little bit aggressive because in inflation, you know, it's it's still way above their target. So so what I think, I think the market, you know, what I've told my subscribers is, is you know, we need to be prepared for maybe no rate cuts, maybe only one rate cut. Yeah, uh, I don't think they're actually going to hike rates. I think that would be way too much of a, you know, that would be just way too much of a flip flop. But there's other things they can do to tighten without necessarily hiking interest rates. But, you know, I don't want to invest money, you know, hoping for a Fed rate cut. That's, you know, that's not what I want to do. Yeah. So I want to go back to something you said earlier. Um. Most stocks tend to follow the direction of the market, right? You can right. always find pockets of strength. Even oh, yeah. Through, you know, in a corrective environment like this, you could find stocks that are working. Absolutely. Is it just that your odds of being right or winning on a long trade are lower? What when what I don't want to get what I don't want to get caught in. So it's a good question. But yeah, copper miners are working. You know, stocks like General Electric have been super yeah. strong. The defense stocks are strong. Raytheon, Spotify. There, there's plenty of stocks why, yeah. that that are working, you know. And I'm holding a bunch of uptrends. But what I don't want to do is I don't want to start a new position right now and then get caught up in just the, you know the market starts to unwind for whatever reason because the market is weaker. I, I brought uh, an S and P oscillator chart that we'll look at shortly i think that'll show the market's pretty oversold but yeah if you look for example at the copper miners chart there's a lot of charts that look great copper miners freeport mac moran tech mm -hmm. resources a lot of energy charts are really strong uh ge is super strong there's a lot of industrials that are strong but what i want to be mindful of right now and I've been moving a lot smaller. So my position buys over the past month or two have been more in the, you know, one, two, three percent range. Whereas in November, I was, you know, buying five to 10 percent positions in the course of a day. But what I don't want to do is start a big position and then the market just sells off for whatever reason, because we're so weak. And then my strong chart gets caught up in just a broad pullback. Right. So I'm, I'm holding I'm holding almost everything. You know, I reduced a little bit of tech. You know, I didn't clear out entirely, but maybe I took a, a 
3% position and dialed it down to a 2% position, something like that. But I, I would feel better. You know, I think there's a, a pretty strong oversold reversal coming in the S&P, whether it's today or it's in a week, I don't, I don't know. But I would feel better buying once we get that, that sharp turn back up and then just sitting on what I'm sitting on right now and hoping I don't get stopped out of anything. How, how, do you, how do you pick strong stocks, Larry? Are you using, you know, a purely bottoms up strategy to find individuals name, individual names? Or are you deploying some sort of a top down, you know, technical approach? It's, it's all technical. So what I do when I, when I run my screener is I start for stocks that are trading over the 2050 and 200 day moving average. Then I'll okay. screen the sectors to see where the stronger sectors are. And then I'll use relative strength. So for the most part, I'm ideally looking for stocks that are either breaking out of a base or mm -hmm. very, very close to breaking out of the base and the short term momentum is, is is turning up. So, you know, a chart like, say, General Electric, a yep. chart like those copper miners. I recently started a position in tech resources uh, a few days ago. A week. So you see that GE chart to me, that's a, this is a chart. So I've got a position in GE right now. But to me, this is a this is a chart that if the markets start to turn up, I think GE is one of the first charts that breaks out again. It's I mean, on, on yeah. top of all the moving averages. It's got a nice few weeks consolidation. But that's so that chart structure right there is the type of chart that I'm looking for. Strong relative strength, very close to the highs, you know, with a lot of support beneath it. Yeah, just a really nice coil. Yeah. What, what about this S&P chart? The Let's bring up the oscillator chart here. Uh, yeah, that's an interesting chart. Yeah. Tell us how, how, how we should think about this. Yeah, oh, so so yeah. what this shows, the S&P McClellan oscillator, this just measures the internal S&P 500 market breadth. And, and where you're at, this was the close yesterday. So this is the eighth lowest close for that oscillator over the last 10 years. So the, the market internally, the S&P oscillator is pretty blown out. And if you look at, at some of the major turns, you know, last year in July, it was negative 111. At the, at the lows in 2022, September, it got to negative 152. But what I found is once the internal oscillator gets to be, you know, negative 80, negative 100, then the, the market's fairly oversold and the reversals when they hit are generally pretty sharp. But there's a couple caveats that go with this thing. So the, the first thing is that it, even if we get an oversold reversal in the next few days, it doesn't necessarily mean that that's the, the end of this pullback phase because in 2022, the oscillator hit negative 90, negative 100 and bounced higher. Yeah. But then you got another leg lower in the S&P. But, but I use these oscillators at the extreme. So like if I was looking to short something today, you know, I don't know that with the, the oscillator is blown out as it is, I'd look to be starting new short positions. But this, you know, historically, when it gets to be this low, the market's pretty oversold. The other, the other thing, is it can't, you know, oversold is a sign of weakness, not strength. So I'm not going to go out and buy stocks today just because the oscillator is oversold. And it, it can go lower. You know, it was negative 152. It was negative 165 in 2020. So, you know, oversold can get more oversold. But if there's a catalyst, if bond yields pulled back for some reason, uh, you know, if the market really likes some type of earnings, you know, what we need to see is we need to see the S&P not fade every day. So the S&P has closed lower than the open five of the past six days. Every strong open has faded. So what we need to see is if there's going to be a reversal, we need to see either a strong open that stays strong yeah. or a weak open that reverses higher. Yeah, really no evidence of a tradable low yet, particularly at the index level. Larry, uh, I want to go back to something you said earlier. Uh, and 
whether so what when you are positioned you know heavy cash or even just slightly more cash than normal right um how do you go about redeploying that or or even right now for example how would you go about um you know re- deploying whatever cash you've raised in the last couple of weeks what, what what signs are you looking for but but also just like psychologically how are you doing it well, I'd want to see some buy signals. So I've got about 84% stocks. I do have 6% in commodities. So I'm about 9%, 10% cash. But before I really put anything to work here, I'd, I'd like to see a really strong reversal in the S&P 500. Maybe a day where you have an 85% upside day. You know, yesterday, 41% of the S&P was higher. You know, if, if we get... Uh, The ideal scenario would be either a quick gap down, selling flush, and then reversal where the shorts cover and new longs come in. Or if you get a scenario where the the shorts or the sellers just get worn out. But I I would really, before I feel like saying, okay, there's, there's a buyable signal in the market, I'd like to see a really strong day in the S&P 500, maybe up you know, one and a half percent for the day, maybe 85 percent of the stocks higher. But I, I want to see some real money coming in. I don't want to be the first one in. Because right now, the, the yeah. momentum, the, the near term momentum is to the downside. And so I'm just going to wait. I'm, I'm not going to try to call the bottom for anything. I'm OK being the second guy through the door. You know, let somebody else go in first. And I want to buy some real strength. I don't want to buy weakness. And then I want to buy strong charts. You know, I'm looking at Micron technology. I don't have a position there. I'm looking at stocks like, you know, Western Digital. Uh, you know, I'd like to add to these copper miners, but I'm, I'm going to wait until the the market actually see there's some real, real buying in the market. So, we you know, one thing we notice when we do our bottoms up scans is you get a beautiful read on what are the strongest groups or areas of the market, right? So you've mentioned copper miners, you mentioned tech a couple of times. What are some themes that you see in terms of strength beneath the surface? In, in which part say I, I missed you. When you do these bottoms up scans, you get, right. you get insight into, Oh, copper miners are strong. This is a good group right now. You know, tech is still resilient, right? This is a good group. So like, what are you finding pop up as the strongest names or any themes, you know, rising in terms of strength beneath the surface? Like what groups are you kind of leaning into? So right now, still copper miners, yeah. the industrial sector, there's there's a lot of strength. I would say on a on a sector basis, right? Yeah. The strongest group of charts overall before this, you know, drawdown over the past week or so was That's really right. the industrial sector. And, and I think the industrials benefit from a lot of things. You know, jobs are strong. Economic data is strong. Yeah. Uh, GDP, they continue to raise GDP estimates. The ISM manufacturing index showed positive for the first time in 17 months over 50. So really the industrial sector and, you know, stocks like Caterpillar, you know, GE again, uh, there's a lot of stocks that are tied to the AI data center build out like Eaton Corporation, yes. mm-hmm. Vertiv. You know, I, I I posted a video the other day. So in, in the next like 10 to 15 years, there's expected to be over a trillion dollars between AI data centers. Microsoft just signed on. I think they're building a $100 billion wow. data center with open AI. Amazon's on slate for $150 billion. But, you know, there, there's a lot of shovels that have to go into the ground. There's a lot of concrete. So the, the industrial sector is a theme that's been working for a while. Copper yep. miners really just came on in the past two months. <clears throat> you know, gold really just started to break out in the past few months. Energy has been coming on for the past two months. And then I'm still a believer. Listen, AI, it, it's still early. I know people maybe are, you know, AI it out and we hear about AI, but it's, you know, if you look at Taiwan Semi's earnings report today, they had a very strong, uh, you know, commentary on AI. NVIDIA is trading at 28 times forward earnings. That You know, AI is not going to stop. This whole shift isn't going to stop because bond yields went up 50 basis points or, 
you know, Jerome Powell's briefcase is in his left hand and not his right hand or whatever, you know, the market <laughs> focus on, you know, so these are these are our longer term themes. So what I want to try to do in this volatility is, you know, hold my AI positions. You know, I've got NVIDIA, I've got Meta, I've got uh, Microsoft. I want to try to, you know, hold those positions here. And then if the market turns up, you know, then I, I can add or what have you. But really, and then obviously the, the drug stocks, Lilly and Novo, GLP-1, that's a huge theme. It's not right now because for the past, you know, six, eight weeks, the markets are rotating into inflation. But mm. that that's a strong, that's a huge market. Lilly's drug yeah. just got, you know, a check mark yesterday for treating sleep apnea. And I think that, Great. you know, that's, it's huge. It's a mega trend. Oh, um, yeah. I also think, you know, it's a good lesson. The way you got to the AI conversation before you started mentioning NVIDIA and all the, the tech stocks everybody knows is through industrials. Yeah. So AI is a huge theme, but the pond to look for AI opportunities is far larger than just technology. Oh, yeah. It's everywhere. Utilities, if you look at, at Vistra Energy, VST, yep. you know, they're they're big in nuclear power. And what happens is these AI data centers, they eat electricity. They they just soak up electricity. Yep. So, you know, uh, NRG Energy, I think Constellation Energy, these utilities that have nuclear power and Vistra, I think, is the biggest one. You know, Vistra is up like 60 or 70 percent year to date and it's a utility. So I think that infrastructure and, you know, I've seen some commentary, you know, copper as an AI play, copper is green energy, you know, but but I think infrastructure, power generation and industrials is a good non tech way to benefit from what's happening. No, I love uh, it. Larry, where does crypto fit into your strategy if at all so i hold some bitcoin i'm a long term you know i'm a believer in bitcoin i think bitcoin you know whatever the most bullish longer term hundred thousand two hundred and fifty thousand whatever it is i do think longer term bitcoin is definitely here to stay yep. and it's you know it's being being more and more adopted other than that though i really don't do too much with crypto I don't do anything with the miners. You know, the miners to me are a lot like meme stocks. Mm -hmm. You know, they're up 80%, they're down 80%. So I'm I'm a believer in Bitcoin. I am a believer in in crypto overall, but really Bitcoin through the ETF IBIT, you know, is how I I mostly handle that. Now, did you have exposure before you had the spot ETFs? That's what I was going to ask. Right? Or did the the launch uh, Yeah. Of these spot ETFs bring you in? I've had a I've had a little bit of physical Bitcoin and Coinbase for a few years now. Yep. It started off small, it's gotten a little bit bigger, but it's it's a really small allocation that I, I you know, to me, Bitcoin is something that if you're a believer, I think you just it that's a longer term buy and hold. But you, you feel better holding your position through someone like BlackRock than Coinbase, I feel like. Well, I've got, so I've got multiple, I've got, you know, a lot of different accounts, you know, uh -huh. where, where I do stuff. But for me, IBIT is an easier way for me to track it on a, you know, if I'm looking to trade it, you know, over a three to six month window, you know, IBIT is a little bit easier for me. And for the website, because what I, what I try to do on the website is really focus on instruments that, that most investors have access to. And it's a lot yeah. easier for, you know, for the average person just to, to buy IBIT. Not everyone wants to open a Coinbase account or feels comfortable. You know what I mean? So Absolutely. I try to focus on the higher volume stuff that everyone follows. So when, when, when you said you focus on large cap stocks, is that just because that's what most people focus on? Or is that also just what you are most interested in? That's what I like. Okay. You know, I, I, you know, when I, it's a funny thing when I first started, so I was a broker with Merrill Lynch, you know, 98 for about five years. And when I first started, I, I worked with this guy, he was a you know million dollar producer corner office. He was a high roller. And I used to eat lunch with these guys every day and just try to soak up what they were saying. And I told him about some, you know, small cap stock. And he said, listen, you know, no one's ever going to fire you for buying Johnson and Johnson, but they might fire you for buying XYZ. Yeah. 
So yeah. I just started to gravitate towards, you know, the Microsofts and the Exxon Mobiles and stuff. And, and over time, I've just become, I like the higher volume institutional stuff. You know, so I want to get, you know, I think that you can trade any macro theme, you know, so if I'm, I'm looking at copper, I'm going to look at Freeport or I'm going to look at tech resources or something like that, you know, but I, I'm just more comfortable with, you know, $10 billion and higher, higher volume stuff with a lot of, you know, a lot of liquidity. Uh, so that's just, you know, over the years, what's what's worked best for me. You're also increasing your odds at success when you use this is a market cap filter, right? Yeah. And filtering by market cap is one of the simplest and really best quality filters out there because you can't get big unless you're doing something right. Some of these small cap stocks, the reason we were just talking about how breath is so terrible in the Russell 2000, and it's really fine or pretty decent in the S&P 500. The, the difference in quality between these $1 billion names and $100 billion names is massive. Right. So yep. you're fishing in a pond with better fish. Also, I, I don't like I don't like big gaps down. You know, yeah. I, I hate big gaps down. And well, you that can, can happen to anyone down, you know, with anything. But I've That's... seen some of these small cap stocks. I, I didn't have a position, but I remember that stock Credo. I think it's CRDO. And, and I think one day a year or two ago, it gapped down like 45 percent or something crazy at the open. I just don't like surprises. So I feel like if I get into, you know, and, and I, you know, I'll go into some high volatility stuff like a crowd strike, a Z scale, or, you know, you can make a ton of money in, in large caps, you know, just because they're large caps, it doesn't mean you can't make money. But There's I just feel more Nvidia. comfortable, you yeah. know, the NVIDIAs and the Taiwan semis and, and the meta, you know, I, I like the big names because that's really where the institutional money is going. You know, it's not going into a, a a three hundred million dollar market cap stock that does twenty thousand shares a day that can work just great. You know, if you get the right small cap, you can make a ton of money. But I just I like the big caps. Yep, I do too, Larry Spencer. You got anything else? No, no. I mean, I think this is a great conversation. Um, and uh, um, let's, let's do one more. I agree on a lot. Yeah, yeah. Of course, technicians. Um, Larry and I did a video with I think it was Jason Purse. Uh, yeah, a few weeks ago. Yeah. Uh, it was a blast, but we, yeah, we good talk. time. Uh, one more. You mentioned commodities. I can't let you go without telling us which commodities. It sounds like some copper. And then how are you doing it? Are you using like the ETNs as vehicles? Yeah. So I'm in GSG and GSG is a recent buy for me. I, I generally prefer the stocks, you know, so the energy stocks, yeah. XLE, ExxonMobil, you know, I've got some Phillips 66 PSX. Yeah. But I, I I went with a little basket of the physical only because if you get into a really wonky stock market, and I'm not saying that we will, but if you get into you know a broad stock market sell off for whatever reason, they'll sell off every stock. It doesn't matter you know if it's an energy stock or if it's a copper stock. If you know if fund managers just decide that they want some liquidity. Right. Then they can sell everything. So with with the basket of commodities, while it can be volatile, it's the actual commodity. You know, it's a basket of the physical and not the stocks themselves. But I've got energy stocks too. Uh, Larry, one, one more for you. Give yeah. us one name that you've recently traded, recently being the last year or so, maybe two years, that didn't work out for you, and why? Oh, so some high volatility stuff. So Celsius Holdings. Oh yeah, stopped out, you know, and it's the ones that didn't work out that you always remember that I always remember the most, yep. you know. So I got stopped out of Celsius probably right at the lows before it doubled. Now I'm watching it again. Super Micro, I, I got stopped out of Super. I bought Super Micro at the wrong time, and I got stopped out, and then that, you know, that went on a pretty big run. So it it's going to happen. I don't like when it happens. You know, recently I had Marathon Petroleum, MPC, and it wasn't doing anything. And I said, you know, this this energy sector is kind of dead. Yeah. So I sold it for about a 4% gain. And then it went up, you know, maybe another 34%. Right. So, you know, so my timing wasn't that good there. But, you know, it's usually it's when I get into the higher volatility stocks like Celsius and Supermicro and 
uh, you know, my timing just wasn't right. Right. Uh, this is great. I, I love your honesty. Thank you for that. Cause people need yeah. to hear this. Larry is a successful trader. How long have you been doing this, Larry? So I started in the markets in 1998. Right. And he's telling you he missed on a stock like Supermicro this year, yeah. one of the biggest market leaders. This is frustrating for us. But Steve, don't rub it in. <laughs> no, but it's important. It happens yeah. all the time. Um, some of these names are just hard to trade. Yeah. So, it, it, you know, that was the thing. So I've had NVIDIA for a long time, but I, you know, I, I run stops anywhere from, you know, 8% to 15% based on the volatility. And super micro, I, I put my stop where they shouldn't hit it. Yeah. And they got it. And then, and then that, well, I was probably the last guy that sold. <laughs> you were the shake. Yeah. They got yeah. me. Hey, it happens to the best of it, us. It happens. That's awesome. Yeah. Uh, Larry, we'll have to have you back on. Right. This is Larry Tenderelli, the link to his site, Bluetooth Daily, and also his Twitter are both in the description on YouTube. Check it out. Larry, this has been great, man. Thanks for coming on. Guys, thanks for having me on. I, I really appreciate it, and uh, I look forward to seeing you again. All right. Larry. Also, his bookshelf game is on point. Uh, that's mine. great. That was great. I hope everybody heard um, the last thing he said about some of his losers this year. That's also... You know you're talking to a real trader when you ask somebody, what are your most memorable trades, your biggest trades, your best winners? And they, Most traders will say, I don't really know, but let me tell you about this loser I had. Right. Because the losers, about, are, the, losers are the ones that stay with you. I'll never. When we were interviewing Jim Rogers, we wanted to ask him, what were your best trades? He had nothing for us, but he could have talked for hours about his worst trades. So that it sticks with you and you learn from them. That's why you remember more, right? You're learning a lot more from the losers. Um, a lot of times what we're doing here is more about what not to do, mm -hmm. what to ignore, when to sit on your hands, as opposed to when to be active and when to actually do something. So, And, and that's why uh, so much focus is paid to risk control, right? Because the losers always hurt more than the winners feel good, right? That's just the way it goes. So... so a lot of psychology uh, yep. behind it all. So I want to just address the. There's a silly comment in the chat about ASML. Let's let's get this ASML chart up here. Um, yeah. So yeah. So again, sometimes the headlines and the chart, you know, don't always match up. ASML. Their earnings last night or yesterday Someone morning, whatever, like whenever it came out. Or? I mean, light. They they said objectively, the order orders were light. That's what they said. Listen, this is one of those. Uh, semiconductor ecosystem names. These guys are critically important to the global business landscape. Same as Taiwan Semi, same as NVIDIA, right? Not Intel. Uh, ASML is now same chart as, do you remember all those charts I brought yesterday? Clear levels, clean levels, uh, early leaders, bullish momentum regimes, primary trend undeniably higher, pulling back to such a logical level at the prior cycle highs. I'll I'll be uh, dabbling, dipping my toes into ASML here today. I'll buy this weakness. All right. No, I would, I would, I would not be. <laughs> JC would want to see uh, two green candles, and then he would he would dabble. No, right? I just I I. It's not like one thing for me. It's more like time. It's more of a time thing for me. It's not like a certain level or what it would need to do. It's really I'm just buying, time. I'm buying common stock with a long time frame. Nothing wrong with that here. I I don't think there's I don't think there's that many things wrong with that. No, right? <laughs> tight stop, tight stop. I, or I've seen I've seen I've seen people do dumber things. Or I could treat it if this is something I want to own for years. Right, play this whole AI super cycle. I can scale in here if we get more weakness i could scale in more where the gray dotted line is drawn yeah but if asml is oh, below 900 you really want to own this thing i got levels here I got no levels. but what i'm saying is 900 like if we're it's below 900 market. there's nothing to talk about here right it's a bull market i i'm i'm into buying dips i don't know how far those dips go though i th this this eventually completes this pattern eventually completes them you know maybe I mean, I agree that it eventually completes. I'm not just going to sit around with my thumb up my ass owning things you. that are going down or sideways. That's 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 what I'm afraid of, right? I've been sitting around with my thumb up my ass waiting for things to break out. I've been there before. It's not a pleasant feeling. And my suspicion is... 
well, by being too aggressive on the long side in certain things that are failing is putting myself in a vulnerable position to perhaps be sitting around with my thumb up my ass waiting for a breakout. I don't like it. Sitting around like doing it. nothing is better than the than one than one of the alternatives, which is uh, being long and wrong, right? So, listen, if it's above nine hundred, I don't hate the trade. I just don't necessarily think it's going to be hanging around above nine hundred. I guess we'll see. Yeah, it's right there. Right. I I mean, I think it's you know, uh, not really. Yes, uh, it's not really one of the stronger areas in this market. It's, it's, it's nine thirty one. Let's, Bad day for let's just bring up the earnings calendar real fast. Uh, it's it's like some it's pretty light this week, but we do do we do have Netflix uh, tonight. That's kind of the big one of the week here on the earnings front. So we'll definitely talk about that yep. tomorrow. Um, yeah, there you go. Not much on not much not much tomorrow morning. American Express, I guess, and P and G, but Netflix is going to be the headliner, no doubt. Um, and then anything on the hot corner today? No. 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 Nothing. All right. Which is interesting, uh, well, how, right? I mean, do you, do you? I mean, it's been a little bit uh, quiet. Earnings. Any any thoughts on how quiet the hot corner has been lately? Earnings. Oh yeah, true. Uh, yeah, they're blacked out. So the form fours yeah, really dry up. It's we're, the thirteens and the president. Yeah, we're just now coming out of, of that. WD, the president and CEO of WD forty with a Piker purchase of a hundred grand. That's embarrassing. That's embarrassing. That's, that's an Eddie Elfenbein stock. Isn't it hundred grand? Why? I mean, you're the CEO of WD forty. I mean, hundred grand, bro. That's all you. Come on. Again, it's they do it as a signal. Like it's just it's a part of the CEO's job to step in and buy at certain points. So I I get right, it. But is it isn't the signal when he buys so little that he's just they're, kind of like saving face? He doesn't actually want to lose more money. They're hoping, right? Uh, maybe not. Everyone looks through these things as meticulously as we do, right? There could be a headline: CEO of WD40 buys shares. That could be all they're looking for sometimes. So, right, Dawson's right. What is this? A purchase for ants? Hundred grand, bro? Come on. I, what are you doing with that? I, I can. That company continues grand? to amaze me. Uh, WD40 what? amazes me as a company because who do you know that has ever run out of WD40? Like, yeah, you buy it you once. It's a great you point. You buy it once and you're probably good, right? The WD-40 <laughs> bottle, if you go find it, like in your parents' garage, it's literally from the 1980s. It's the same one. Yes, Can I just tell it, you that if, yes. you have, if you have a problem with carpenter bees, you spray the WD-40 in their holes, woo, they're gone. Yeah. <laughs> I learned that on Twitter. I had, a, I had a carpenter bee problem a couple of years yeah. ago, and Twitter's like, WD-40, bro, all day. I'm like, really? So, no. Okay. Those things, the carpenter ant, they'll eat your house. Carpenter they're, bees. They're not but ants. carpenter ants, aren't they the same? Don't they turn into bees? Oh, they're very, very. Ants turning into bees, bro? Some really? bugs turn into bees? No? Does somebody want to smack them? Does someone want to <laughs> smack them? What are you talking about, bro? Like tadpoles yeah. turn into frogs, dude. No. No? Right. Uh, carpenter, carpenter ants are actually my favorite bug. Caterpillars turn into butterflies. I'll tell you a story about Costa Rica one of these days. <laughs> All right, not, it's not for public uh, disclosures. Yeah. Hey, you know what we haven't done for a minute. Let's let's look at the chart report. How about that? Please. All right. Haven't done that in a while. I really like the evil Knievel right. quote Shout of out. the day. Uh, risk what? is good. Not properly managing your risk is a dangerous leap. Evil Knievel. Oh. Great quote, Pat. Great quote of the day. Oh, that was the quote of the day. That was down here. Yeah. It's a great quote. I was going to say, cut out to the forgotten middle child in the chart of the day. If my, if my screen wants to load, there it is. Mid caps. Justin Spittler has been on the show. A lot before. of a uh, lot of failed breakouts. So many. Seeing it mid caps. You're seeing it. I mean, you're seeing it across the board. I mean, breakouts keep failing. So if we know that fa breakouts keep failing, do I think it's a good idea to be trying to buy breakouts? I do not. 
I think it's a good idea to be taking advantage of those traders that are being impatient and uh, happily accept their donations. That's how I, I think about it. You know? Um, yeah, and, and a lot, no surprise, a lot of charts, I think pretty much all the charts today reflecting the same sentiment, which is uh, market, market go down for now. You know, I really um, like uh, that chart sh in the top 10 by JC Peretz at All Star Charts. Uh, you may have heard of him. How far down do I got to go to get that one? Great, great follow on Twitter. You guys should check that out. Uh, showing the consumer discretionary index relative to the S&P 500 making new 52 week lows. Yeah, I, I, I'm old enough to remember when the consumer was important. How about discretionary you know? for staples from Shane Murphy? Discretionary versus staples also, um, you know, struggling, right? Looks a little better, which staples is, you know. Uh, well, when the denominator is consumer staples versus <laughs> the denominator being the S&P 500. True. Right? Hey, look at Sam Gallen making it into the chart report. Well done, Sam. Sam making the top 10. All right. Um... And then Sam Rowe, who was on yesterday. Look, guys, uh, the chart report goes out every chart single... Great by Sam Rowe, by the way. I retweeted that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is this is fantastic. It, it, it's always good to uh, remind yourself the relative size of our market versus everybody else's market. Um, but, uh, and how that's changing. Look, uh, Patrick Donawilla, who comes on our show on Tuesdays, puts this chart report together every single day, Monday through Friday, it is totally free. The link to sign up is in the description. It's actually the second link in the description. It's right where it says under free re free research. It says the chart report. You can sign up there and um, get it in your inbox. Usually around six, seven in the evening. Uh, if you're on the East Coast, the roundup of all the best charts that were shared on Twitter that day. Pat does a tremendous job with that. Wait, do ants really turn into wasps or is someone just trolling me? I can't I'm even with you. you today. What's the matter hey. with you, bro? Uh the ants down here have wings. They don't have they don't have like elementary school fly. in uh Connecticut. Like they don't teach you just basic science. I don't like bugs. I don't too like busy that. watching women's college basketball. Listen, um, I got a fun fact. Ready? So uh I was just doing a little math the other day. Cause I do I like to do that sort of thing on my off time. There are, you ready for this, 1.5 trillion barrels of oil reserves worldwide. 1.5 trillion barrels. So at today's price, you're looking at about $130 trillion worth of oil uh, in reserves, right? It's $130 trillion worth of oil, which is a lot. Now let's do another little bit of math. So $13 billion of oil are produced every day. So it's about $1.2 trillion of oil. So for perspective, we've got about 130 days of oil in global reserves. So if we yeah, stop producing oil. When you put it like that, it doesn't sound like a lot. <laughs> it doesn't sound like a lot, right? Yeah, but that doesn't get shared when shit hits the fan. It's what you you have in your country's reserves. That's that that's true. That's also right? true. Well, that's where supply and demand comes in. Because if the if the price is right, they'll sell it to you. No, I guess depends how serious the situation. I don't know. <laughs> uh, we, we have a lot of oil. Who knew? Yeah. Still using it. Wow. None of us lived only one hundred and twenty days. Hmm. One hundred and twenty. So one point five trillion in oil reserves. The United States represents about twenty percent of that. So we control 20% of the oil reserves. So on 130 days, if 130 days, if we have 20% of that, we run out of days. Less, About a month? A month, just a few weeks. That doesn't sound month. Like we'll we'll call it a month. Yeah, let's call it a month. What do you what do you think? You like you like those oil facts? Those are some fun facts, no? I thought they were they fun. Are. They are. A lot of oil. You think? Yeah, think that much. <laughs> Thirty trillion is not a small, small dollar value. I know, but ours is only like thirty trillion in America. All right, it doesn't seem like that much. It's not. 
right? I would have thought more. I hadn't really thought about it, which is why I was doing this math. So I just wanted to share uh, my my math with you guys. Well, that's why that's why it's always the kind of the big deal when anyone says, "Oh, are we potentially drawing from the the the, the SPR, right, the Strategic Petroleum Reserve?" That's that's why that because people know that we don't have that much on a relative basis compared to how right. much we use. They don't let them set up new rigs. Are we uh, are we bringing Sean on? Because I want to talk about making it rain. We can bring Sean on. Can we talk about making it rain? Yeah, I was listening I, to that little Wayne song this morning. Make it rain. Yeah, make it rain. We're making from it rain. like 2006, that one. Uh, yeah. The Carter Two was one of the greatest rap albums of all time. Gosh, you I haven't tell, heard that you can song. Tell he wasn't listening to rap in the time. 90s with a comment like that. All time, it was that good. And I was listening to rap. I haven't heard Make It Rain in phew, a decade, maybe more. Anyway, let's bring Sean on. Listen I'll make it rain. I'll make Hi, Sean, Sean. What's, baby. what's up, boys? Big Daddy, you got little, little sniffles? What's going on over there? You know, it happens, bro. It happens. My kids are sick, like, just always. So it's, it's, oh, bound, to, yeah. it's bound to get to me. Wait till wait till all three of them are in school, and phew, they're going to be bringing stuff home every week. Man, it's crazy. Um, <laughs> so uh, so uh, we had a great meeting yesterday, I thought. Um, you know, we had some disagreements, and then at the end of the day, you know, we finally agreed. You know, I like the thought process of making it rain, right? That's just making it rain. Calls and puts all day long. Just make it rain, make it rain, right? That's that's what I like um, in this market. I don't like directional positioning, this buy the dip, you know, trying to buy breakouts when breakouts keep failing. Like, that just seems too hard. Seems too annoying. Uh, being patient has... Uh, continues to reward investors as we've seen over the last couple of months impatient investors are getting whipped around uh premium sellers are collecting more income uh than they have in six months right that's the sort of thing that i want to do well my portfolio oh. agrees with you jc uh it's been a busy week uh had uh, i don't know i think eight positions stopped out this week which is the most i've had stopped out in a long time they all they some of them were winners, which is great. You know, we were just harvesting some profits. Uh, but yeah, it's been a busy week, and and it's and people who are making directional bets here are having a hard time, myself included, for sure. I agree. Um, I also like the idea of if you're bullish this market and you think the market's going to go higher, or you're bullish a stock and you think the stock's going to go higher, the thought of selling naked puts is not a terrible idea we actually did that yesterday um you know we don't we don't need to talk about the stock or the strike price or anything like that but we found the stock that we really like uh that has pulled back very aggressively over the last couple of weeks volatility is elevated premiums well, are juicy and we yeah, can well, sell out of the money puts well, so well, in a worst case scenario it. if we get put the stock we're happy to own it because we think it goes up right yeah what what we what we hammered out in our meeting yesterday was that uh, you know there, there's a bit, there was a bit of a disagreement amongst all the analysts right like nobody's insanely bullish but we do want to position ourselves in case the market is just completing a pause here and it's about to take off we don't want to be aggressively bullish but it, it's good to have exposure in case that happens meanwhile volatility is elevated there's a high risk the market's just going to go sideways for a little while. Um, and so we wanted to try to find some trades that would that would benefit from either of those scenarios playing out. And yeah, like you said, selling puts, selling naked puts, maybe selling some put spreads, um, maybe putting on um, iron condors or strangles, but have that have a little bit of an upside bias, meaning you're selling further away on the upside than you are on the downside, just to give a little bit of room for an upside resolution if one happens. Those types of trades can play pretty well in this environment and those are the types of trades we're looking for right now um you know it, it, until things change that's we got to work with what the market's given us right and i like what the market's giving us most and i also like that most investors don't like it right like this <laughs> this is very frustrating for a lot of traders and investors and i love that right love that right they're making donations so let's collect 
Well, that's why, you know, I'm joking about making it rain. I'm not really joking. We literally are making it rain calls and puts, you know? Yeah, these these are the types of markets. Uh, I, th I think our friend Brian Shannon likes to say that if they don't uh, stop you out, they wear you out, right? When you get into markets like this, the people who are impatient are just going to get chopped up. Um, and uh, that can create opportunity for people like us who can come in with a plan to take advantage of that. I love, I love markets uh, that frustrate investors, especially when we recognize that frustration and try to and, and, and profit from that, right? Because I, th I think just a lot of investors, they don't think that way. They don't think, oh, you know, other investors are getting chopped up. Let's collect their donations. They're, they're too self-absorbed and they got their heads up their own asses. So they're so impatient that they turn into those traders that are making those decisions. Like they can't, they can't step away from their own brain. They're so stuck in their own ways that they're not recognizing the opportunity. And I think that's great. Yeah. And look, we would all love to have a market like we had from the end of October into uh, early January, where we just, the market just goes straight up every day. We would all love that. We would all be geniuses in a market like that, but that's just not the way it works. <laughs> it actually rarely ever works that way. Uh, only from extremes in bearish positioning and sentiment, which obviously we were in October. You know, everybody thinking the world was going to come to an end. We were obviously betting on the exact opposite. So that worked out real well. Uh, but now that those traders that thought that the world was coming to an end are now like, oh, well, maybe it's actually a bull market. Now they're trying to incorporate the strategies that they wish they were putting on last year. Right. So it's, it's you know, as Spencer said, it's a lag. Absolutely. By the way, I just noticed, guys, that uh, I'm talking to you, and if my if my microphone sounds funny, it's because I'm using the wrong microphone. I just noticed that, <laughs> so I apologize. Sean got all new equipment. Stay I got all new equipment, and now I'm not even using it. <laughs> you, you sound good to me. I didn't even notice. <laughs> yeah, this sounds terrible. Well, we're gonna change it here. All right. Sean, can you talk to me a little bit about? Um, you know, a few of the different strategies that are that are good for these high volatility, um, higher volatility, I should say, um, you know, messy markets. You know, I really like how when we're looking at ETFs, it's OK to be naked short calls, naked short puts, you know, because it's a basket of stocks. So you're eliminating some of that overnight disaster uh, moves that in, in either direction, you're mitigating that risk tremendously. So when you are selling a strangle, selling an out-of-the-money call, an out-of-the-money put in an individual stock, like we did in John Deere recently, for example, we want to buy further out-of-the-money calls to hedge that side and buy further out-of-the-money puts to hedge that side so we could sleep at night, right? In an ETF, you don't necessarily have to take that extra step, but in the stock market, we like to do that. Can you talk a little bit, you know, because some of our audience members, you know, might not have experience with these particular types of strategies in these particular types of markets and perhaps would like to take advantage of all the donations that are being made out there and collect them like we have been. Can you, can you walk through that thought process of sure, both sure. those strategies, the condor and the strangles? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, let's start with a strangle. That, that's, that's kind of the basic building block. A strangles where you sell an out of the money put and you sell an out of the money call naked, meaning you have theoretically unlimited risk. I generally only like to do those types of trades in ETFs or occasionally in a very large cap stock. Think of something like an Apple or a Microsoft, something that doesn't have as big of a gap risk. That's the thing we're trying to avoid. We're trying to avoid a gap risk. An individual stock has a much higher chance of a gap risk than an, than an ETF, as you alluded to before, because an ETF is a basket of stocks. Yes. A bas uh, an ETF might be heavily weighted towards certain uh, individual names, but there's still an element of diversification that keeps the ETF from having dramatic gaps. Now, we've certainly seen dramatic gaps from time to time. I can remember uh, uh, when the uh, Silicon Valley thing happened, Silicon Valley Bank thing happened. We were uh, short of strangle in KRE that got crushed. That sucked. It happens. But the, the likelihood of that happening is, is uh, far smaller than an individual stock. Now, for the individual stocks, when we wanna put on delta neutral credit spread trades, I will tend to do uh, an iron condor. So an iron condor is the same thing as a straddle where we sold a naked put and the naked call, but then we also 
buy the wings, as you say, we, we buy it in a further out of the money call and a further out of the money put to define our risk so that if the worst case scenario happens, let's say there's an earnings event or a new product release or the CFO suddenly quits and we, you know, nobody saw that coming. If the stock gets crushed, at least we know the worst case scenario, how much we can lose and we could size our position properly so that that type of hit is not detrimental to our portfolio. And so I like to do those types of trades in individual stocks uh, because as you said, JC, I like to sleep at night. Um, I got some breaking news here. Uh, Ooh, I like breaking news. Breaking news, uh, the, the Trumpster, uh, they have issued a, uh, a, a list of tips uh, <laughs> no. for how shareholders can block short sellers from borrowing their securities that's this awesome. is what this is coming down to so as we know from experience that that usually ends well once like you start fighting the short, short sellers, sellers it's all over <laughs> it makes does it involve before. the words compu share and direct register because we've been through this before with other stocks the tips include holding djt shares in a cash account at a brokerage firm as opposed to a margin account opting out of any securities lending program, moving Trump media shares to a company's designated transfer agent and transferring shares to a bank and holding them in your retirement account. If, if people Crazy. want to short something bad enough, they can find a broker uh, that'll let them short it. Uh, we learned uh, this with game. Usually, 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 right? Game, there were more shares. It's easier these shorts, days. It used to be much more difficult slow. 20 years ago. For GameStop. Like short. the routing. Yeah, you, pay, you might pay more, but like... Even if you're paying like a hundred percent interest on a borrow, if you're only holding it for a week, do the math on how much you're actually paying. Yeah, no, so but no, I mean, Steve's, yeah, there are more advanced. There are more advanced. Meanwhile, if I mean, you want to short, there are synthetic if, shorts. If you want to short DJT, isn't like the annualized interest on that something like five hundred percent? Like it's crazy. It's you're not shorting it for a year. Like you're not actually taking well, of course on that not. Barry of course cost. not. But that's still a huge vig you got to pay, even if you want to hold the trade for a week, right? That's that's a huge if commission. You call the commission. Per, if you end up paying three percent of the assets to for a thirty percent gain, you do the trade. Uh, that's just a big headwind. Is all I'm saying. Big headwind. And if people are going to pay that to borrow, the brokers are going to make it available. That's good money. <laughs> That's for sure. Capitalism, they got, baby. They're not taking on any risk. <laughs> so this this is gonna how, get even more fun. How can the borrow fee how can the borrow fee still be this high? If supply and demand if the stock baby. is come crashing down. Well, that's why people want to short it, because you've got you got people that want to short it down. They want to short it you now? People, you got people who hate Trump and just want to be short Trump. So there's that. Like you got all these things. Uh, okay, they want to put it after it fell two thirds. Yes, stay Spencer, away. That's how stay humans work. This. Stay away from this one. This is GameStop. You, yeah, this is a no stocks. touch. Stay, I stay have away. no interest in trading it. Yeah. Whatever. I actually kind of like didn't. it from the long side. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> Kenny. <laughs> Kenny, Kenny just bought it. Kenny's in. <laughs> Kenny just bought it, right? If Kenny's in, you know, how yeah, about Kenny knows base? what he's doing? Kenny, Kenny is more experienced with this stuff than anyone else I know. So I trust him. To trade. Well, hey, I mean, to Kenny's point, like, if you're going to play, I don't want to play it, right? Full disclosure, I'm not going to play it. But if I were to play it, I would definitely play it from the long side because at least my risk is defined, right? It could go to zero and that's the most I could lose. But if I'm short that thing at 26 bucks and it goes back up to 300 because meme stock, uh, whew, that, that that's a big hurt. Yeah, I'm not. I'm. I'm not going to buy it today. Uh, I kind of want to see it dance and set up. Uh, but I'm open minded to buying it. I. I really like. You know. I. I just really like it when investors have like a, you know, a moral or philosophical aversion to something like a Palantir yeah. or a Tesla or a Trump. ESG. You know, it's kind of like a built-in potential short squeeze is all. So something like this, I'd rather be from the long side than the short side. Yep. Right, because you got all these people that are just angry, that want to take their anger out on their portfolio. Right. Yeah. We've we. I mean, how many times have we seen this uh, ideological uh, trade just get crushed eventually? It, it, it works for a little while and then it gets crushed. Every did you time. just say? Did you say idiot logical or? Both? No, but that's that. That's a good. You could say that too. 
It's a you good can one. see that too? Okay. Good one. All right. All right. Let's, let's that recess. Let's recess. I actually would be concerned if Kenny was not buying in the stock. That would be a red flag to me. This is a, Kenny buying is a green flag. Okay. Let's do some recess. All right, ready for ready for what I got tonight. So what I got, I got two racks of ribs, right? Very simple. Set the oven at 220, 220 degrees, nice and low. You get the rack of ribs. You take out that layer, you know, that layer that you got to get out. It's a little bit annoying. With a paper towel, it's easy to rip out. Take off that layer. Then I get a spicy mustard, right? And then Ooh. I spread the spicy mustard all over the ribs, both sides, both racks, and then I season salt, pepper, garlic powder, onion powder, and cayenne, right? And I spread it all in there. Then I get aluminum foil, and I put both of the racks, each one in its own foil pack, nice and tight to make sure that it could really steam in there, right? So I got two aluminum foil packaged wraps, you know, racks of ribs, full racks in the oven at 220 degrees, right? With that seasoning, with the spicy mustard, Tonight, you know, it's not going to taste like mustard afterwards. That taste will go away. And then afterwards, when it's done in about six hours, I go ahead and take it out. Then I put the barbecue sauce on it, spread that, lather that nicely, right? Sweet baby rays is how I'm going to go today. Ooh, uh, sweet, baby rays. sweet baby rays. And then I'm going to sear it under, under with the broil, and I'm going to get that crispiness. Uh, with the barbecue sauce, and it's going to fall off the bone, and that's going to be my dinner tonight, and I'll be putting it in right around noon uh, so it'll be nice and ready for dinner. And that's, you know, a great example of how the oven is very underrated, very <laughs> underrated, the oven. The oh, that's, that's all, all, all going to be in the whatnot, oven? And I'm guilty. I got all those gadgets no. too. The oven, man, the oven. That's all going to be in the oven? Underrated. Shot out oven. <laughs> all right. All right, my recess is a programming note a little bit. Um, I will not, and you guys might be hearing this for the first time, I will not be on this show next week, Thursday, because I'm taking my 10-year-old, or my 9-year-old, excuse me, I'm already aging him, I'm taking my 9-year-old and my wife to the Redwoods National Forest in Northern California end of next week, going on some th three days of hiking, can't wait. Uh, so I won't be here next Thursday, guys. I apologize. That sounds lovely. Is, isn't that lovely. where they filmed uh they filmed like star wars up there with the, with, with the big trees right with like the, the huge yeah, return of the jedi was filmed there uh yeah some scenes from jurassic park were filmed there uh, yeah very cool very cool John, you should go to salsalito and go to sushi ron uh and go get the sushi there it is freaking incredible salsalito okay well, that's a different part of too. northern california i'll do that when we go to sonoma Aren't you this going? Is, aren't you going to the Redwoods? Oh, you're going way up further, right? Redwoods. I mean, we're staying in, in a town called Crescent City, which is literally 10 miles from the Oregon border. Got it. Where are you Ooh. flying into? We're flying to Arcata. It's a one gate airport. It literally, it's one gate. It's the size of a bus station. It's, it's and you can fly direct from Denver. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Fly United direct. They do one flight a day back and forth. It's great. Don't miss uh, it. <clears throat> Wells Fargo's looking pretty good here, Sean. I'll be looking to enter trading that today. Uh, I have yeah, if four... that if that gets back above what is it, fifty six and a quarter, man, we got to get back in that thing for a short term trade. It, it uh, is so there cool. is there any bank stock that's holding up better than Wells Fargo? Said, no, said said no one ever. I mean, this <laughs> it looks great right now. So um, Lombardi's Pizza, four pies delivered to my house yesterday. Love Ooh. the way they do it. They give you like sauce packets and you put the sauce in between the mozzarella cheese on the um, margarita. So it's like really saucy and fresh. I, I don't know how they do it, but they ship these pies and they, they end up tasting really good. So that's the first that's place so. we went to uh, in January, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. We, did our, we did our pizza tour. Yeah, that was the first pizza restaurant, first pizzeria in America. It's Not great. in New York City. America. Are you sure? Pretty cool. So that's their claim to fame. That's neat. Steve, that was from Gold Belly, right? Dude, it was a great deal. The, Gold Belly, best I, website I ever. Shout out Gold Belly. Something. I almost bought a hundred dollar cake last week, but the wife said no, don't do it. So oh. I didn't do it. But it yeah. would have been. They they have some really good sales sometimes. So this was for their Munch Madness uh, sale. Everything was like fifty yeah. percent off during Wait, March. Wait, the, the they called it Munch. The Munch from Madness. Tony Black's. 
brisket from Tony Black's in Austin. Mm -hmm. And it's idiot proof. I was looking at All the right. Dungeons Crab. You ever get seafood from, from Gold Belly? Hell yeah. yeah. Two pounds of Dungeness Crab with the shipping. It's like a hundred bucks though. I like Dungeness Crab a no, lot. So do I. Hey, uh, crab, I underrated. I swear, yeah. JC, I swear this is not a troll. I, I'm legitimately asking because I don't know. Uh, did Miami win that game last night? Are they, they in? Not. Oh, <laughs> I was really, I was, no, I was really hoping that Miami and Denver would play again this year in the playoffs. Sorry, dude. No, no, they, no they, they, they still can. It, They're just but not it's playing unlikely. the Knicks. They're just not going to yeah. play the Knicks. Oh, so it's it's not a one and done in the in that play in tournament. No, it's sort of one and done, but sort of not. Miami's got to win the next game to get the eight seed and play Boston. Oh, okay, I see. I, see how much I know about the NBA. I thought it was just a one it's and okay. done. And you're out. When is yeah. that? Sorry, right. when Shark just discovered that Denver had a basketball team like a couple true years story ago. true story i had no idea until last season i total bandwagon fan i i didn't even watch a single i've been in denver i've been near denver for 11 years now never watched a single nuggets game i watched the first one and the first the first playoff game last season and i watched the whole run into the championship and yeah but your son uh, likes basketball son loves it yeah he's playing he's boy he's we just signed him up for some summer basketball camps he's excited man Nice. All right, guys. I All gotta right. Go. I gotta it's to Thursday. Work. We got options jam session with Sean at noon. We got chart requests live at one. Send in your requests to the inbox. It's on the screen. Questions at stockmarketmedia.com. Thanks to Larry Tenderelli for hanging out today. Thanks to Sean. Thanks to all of you in the chat. That's all for now. Go make some money or sit on your hands, whatever is more profitable. And uh, we'll see you later. Peace. Jam session is going to be hot today. Take no love.